it is uh it's great to see you all again we just wrapped the semester um but uh it feels like in some ways a long semester in some ways a short semester uh, due to the pandemic and this wonderful project and so um by way of introduction uh, my name is Chris Wrights. I am Professor of Critical and Curatorial Studies here at the University of Louisville, um, very close to the Speeds campus, um, in fact, on ours. Uh, and the other uh, folks in the room right now are uh, a, a few of the members of my Art and Activism class, a uh, seminar uh, that took place over the course of this semester. So I'll let those students introduce themselves. Let's start with Kathy. Hi, my name is Kathy Shannon, and I just graduated with my Master of Arts in Critical and Curatorial Studies. Hannah? Yeah, uh, my name is Hannah DeWitt, and I am about to start my second year as an MFA student at U of L. I'm an interdisciplinary artist as well. And Flora? Hi, I'm Flora Schultnack, and I'm beginning my second year of doctoral studies in the Department of Comparative Humanities here at U of L. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of what uh, some of the kind of backgrounds and interests of the students coming in. We it was a it was a terrific class, much larger than this room, but um, because it's now the summer, uh, some of the folks had to take off. But we have got a great representation here, uh, and just to kind of orient us a little bit. Uh, when I started thinking about this class, you know, art and activism, uh, part of the motivation was that, and I think all of you that, that go to museums, that go to art galleries have recognized that political art, however you might conceive of that, um, in some ways dominates what we see today, uh, with the kind of contemporary registers of art making. Uh, and this is not necessarily new. This is uh, in some ways a trend that's been emerging since uh, the 1970s and 1980s. Um, on the other hand, art has punctuated activist movements uh, for at least as long as I've been uh, involved in them. I, I spent a lot of time uh, involved in Occupy Wall Street, for example, and art was a central focus. And as you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and the movement uh, for Breonna Taylor uh, was punctuated by artwork as well. Uh, one of the objects, Erin Conaway's portrait, um, hangs in the speed today. And so, I was thinking about the difference between art with political registers and art that was involved in, in activism and whether or not these things were the same. Uh, and really I was thinking about criteria. How do we evaluate these things? Which maybe sounds like one of those elitist academic things, but remember we have to figure out what we're gonna keep in museums. We have to decide what's going in the textbooks. Um, there's a lot of art and so we, we, we forced to kind of debate uh, the merits of work and then shift what counts as merits depending on what the context of the artwork is. So it provoked all of these questions in me, like uh, do good politics make for good art? Does that mean that you could have a kind of bad painting, but it would be a good painting if their politics were correct? What if you had an artwork with really bad politics, but it was a really good painting? Would that be good art? Um, and so I wondered if the, you know, those criteria maybe change a little bit when we think in terms of activism. Uh, is efficacy an important criteria? So anyway, these are the ideas that are bouncing around in my head. Uh, and then the class started and of course that changes a bit, right? Because the class became the students in many ways. And I don't think they're all motivated by the same questions that I am. And so uh, that was the jumping off point, but not the conclusion. So I kind of want to turn now to the students and ask, um, what motivated you to take a class in art and activism? Uh, were there some kind of driving desires or interests? Um, what do you think? Well, I'll start. Um, what motivated me was the time that we're living in right now and everything that we are seeing. And in my real life, I'm an art dealer. And so I see artists that were capturing the moment um, engaging um, with the public through their artwork. So when I saw that you were teaching this class, it was, it was right. Um, the timing was right. So, and I'm so glad I did because it's, it's been enlightening. It's, it's taken my study and my focus beyond what I had anticipated. And uh, I hope everyone is enjoying the um, exhibition that we put together. 
Um, I'll also chime in on uh, why I decided to take the class. Um, I thought it would be relevant to my artwork. I, I think that a lot of my artwork has um, some political uh, undertones or overtly political messages in it. And also over um, last summer and the protests, I really found myself being politically activated like I never had before. Um, and I really wanted to learn more about the tradition that has come before me of uh, activist art or political aesthetics instead, um, which is a difference that we'll certainly be talking about. Well, I can jump in as well. Um, for me, this class was just clearly an essential. Uh, I'm a fiction writer and a lot of my current fiction deals with the intersection of visual art and social justice. So. I'm really interested in the question of how can visual representations of the social justice issues that we face today, how can those visual representations help us understand how we arrived at these problems? And also how can art help us imagine a better future? And I'm interested in exploring this, not just through research, but through my fiction. So when I saw this class, I thought, well, I've, I've got to see what that's about. And, um, and it was really enlightening, you know, it really, I think that Dr. Wright's really pushed us to ask like, what can we ask of art and what can we ask art to do for us? Uh, not just like intellectually, but actually on the ground. Yeah, and that's a good segue, I think, to thinking to, to we can talk a little bit practically about why we're here today. And the answer to that is that about halfway through the course, uh, the Speed Museum and, and Stephen Riley approached us and asked if we would help uh, produce some of the didactic material, some of the interpretive material uh, to go with Aaron Conaway's portrait of Brianna Taylor. Um, and as you know, you, you, you've heard earlier today from um, Amy Sherald, whose portrait is uh, really the centerpiece of uh, a separate exhibition. Um, and in that exhibition, I think, I mean, the class may push back, but I, I think we would call that political art, right? It, 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 it's high art. It is, um, it, there, there's cultural relevance sort of beyond its politics. Amy Sherald's work, uh, is, it's hung in museums all over the country. Um, and, and it's inflected with, by politics that are local. Whereas Aaron Conaway's work comes out of a movement on the ground here in Louisville. And I, I think the speed wanted us to help navigate those waters a bit. Is there a difference? Is there a difference in orientation? What does it mean that, that Amy Sherald's uh, portrait comes sort of after the fact? Um, not after the murder of Breonna Taylor, but after the fact of, of the demonstrations, after the fact of the role of art in this movement. Um, how do we set these questions up? Uh, and so we began researching and thinking and integrating some of the stuff we talked about uh, in the class. And so for the students, I, I know each of you kind of grappled with this by, by coming at it from different angles, using different historical touchstones. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, the research you did specifically and, and, and how that helped you think about the, you know, the difference between political art or activist art or how these things operate, or if there is a distinction. I, in fact, maybe I'll throw it, Hannah, to you first, because I know you were a little bit uncomfortable with that distinction. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't say I'm uncomfortable with it. I mean, I did spend the entire final paper in the class figuring out what that distinction was, as we all did. Um, so thinking about it a lot, um, I mean, I do think that there is a distinction. The thing that sets my thoughts on it aside, I guess, are that I wonder if that distinction is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as um, intellectuals, we often just yearn to categorize everything. And sometimes those categories aren't entirely necessary. But I, I do think there is a distinction. I, I think that activist art is very um, you know, quote, boots on the ground, or like it, it acts in some way, it usually um, involves more collective thinking, oftentimes tactics of anonymity, um, not always, but often. And also it usually exists in modes outside of normal ways that people make or show art. So although it can end up in the gallery, it's not as often in the gallery, it's more so on the streets because activism is taking place on the streets. So it makes sense that activist art would be at least born from the streets. Um, 
However, I do wonder if the distinction is arbitrary. That's my only um, thought. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily uncomfortable with trying to distinct it. To, yeah, yeah. To dis distinguish between them. Distinguish, yes. Yeah, no, but it's interesting to, I mean, Aaron Conaway's painting begins in the studio, just like Amy Sherald's, but Aaron's work, when it moves to the streets, it changes, because originally it was designed as a platform to help collect and preserve some of the memorial items that were being brought down to Injustice Square. And it was through conversations with other folks on the ground who said, no, 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 you know, prop it up. We don't want to see, we don't want to see it when we look down, you know, we want to see her portrait um, uh, vertically oriented, you know, uh, raise her up, that, that it became that kind of portrait. Um, and so it's not, even though it wasn't a collaborative project in the sense that it, you know, didn't start that way, it really was articulated collaboratively. Um, and it also had a use, right? I mean, it had like, I remember going downtown and people asking for directions and that was like a wayfinding system. Uh, and, and we often don't think about artworks in terms of their use value, which maybe activism uh, demands. Flora, because you had mentioned something about what artwork, did you, what we ask of artwork. Um, and I think that that is, is exactly the kind of question that an activist asks, right? Like, what, what can I do with this? What does it do? Um, do you have thoughts on the kinds of things that activist art does? Sure, I think so. Um, I mean, look, I think that political art can definitely serve as a, a memorial. And I think that Amy Sherald's portrait does this really well. It memorializes both the loss of Breonna Taylor's life, but also a moment in the country where so many people, both in Louisville and nationally, are really coming to a point of needing to reckon with uh, inequality and violence and racial violence. Um, and, and so I think that uh, we're kind of like used to thinking about that function. But I think that Conaway's portrait functions a little differently in a more kind of activist mode probably because it really brought people physically together. Again, it's in the museum now, right? But if you walk behind Conaway's portrait, you'll see that it's held up with a traffic cone, right? That it's got this very like improvised um, uh, setup for standing it upright, which I love that the speed preserved. Uh, because really, I mean, that portrait functioned, yes, to memorialize, but I think also to bring people together, to serve as a wayfinding point, like you said, and then, also, it was shared so much, right? Like on social media and people really kind of used it to, when they photographed it, I almost feel like they were adding their own voice to the narrative that was surrounding the call for justice for Breonna Taylor. Kathy, you, this is something that you had actually mentioned recently, which is that there might be something in the reception of the work of art, like, my interest in criteria comes from a decidedly aesthetic place, which is like, what are the, you know, is the artwork reflecting on the critical values of painting? And, and I think you had said something a while ago that was more along the lines of like, yes, but if a lot of people saw it and shared it and it became important because of that, that's the criteria, right? It's not, it's not the other, you've got the court cart before the horse a little bit. And um, that also might have something you, that might be unique to activist art, maybe not. I, I don't know, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I agree because this is artwork that lives in the moment. It, it was born of the moment and it transcended what its initial purpose was. So if people would have looked at it and said, oh, okay, I don't like that portrait, it would not have had the impact or the staying power to be a part of such a movement. And I, I think it's um, key for me because in the paper that we had to write about the defining the difference in activists and political art, you know, I, I think I said something like the line is so thin that it's almost indiscernible sometimes. Yeah. When you think politics, you're thinking government related. If you think activism, you're thinking engagement. And I think an effective, of either is going to incorporate that. You're going to have an engaged public that ultimately is going to impact governmental decisions. You look at the incident with Breonna Taylor and how it's been remembered and how it's been captured. Um, 
it it's almost like the title of uh, witness remembrance. Mm -hmm. That is our duty. That is our role that we've been put into to witness and remember. And for me, I don't know if I answered your question uh, veered so far off, but that that's what's effective, you know, when you look at what is activist and political. Did it engage? Did it did it change a political course? And I would say in most times, yes. Yeah. And that is an effect that can be both activist and po political. And this is what we kept coming back to this problem. It's funny when we so we each student in the class kind of worked on a node of this of this wall text that you can see if you go to the museum, you, you know, you look on the wall, we've got this. Um, it's not even a timeline, really. It's almost like a timeline, but it's, it's examples. But examples of what? Because we, we started by saying, well, are we getting examples of activist art or political art here? Um, and it, we, we, we kind of flip-flopped a lot on what each of those was. Like, um, I mean, Hannah, which, which node did you work on? Yeah, um, I worked on the Woman House node. Um, as well as being on the editorial team, of, of several of us were, but um, I will be the first to admit that I see Women House as more of a political aesthetics artwork than an activist artwork. Um, I still think it's entirely relevant to the narrative surrounding it, and that's why I still um, chose to include it, but uh, I don't exactly think of Woman House as boots on the ground, although I, I'm sure like renovating this like what was it, a 17 room mansion just before destruction, there were probably lots of boots being worn, but um, the general audience that it attracted was an audience already um, coming for gallery, um, gallery engagement rather than being um, within or um, acting as a part of a, um, like a movement on the streets. Um, so yeah, I actually think that um, Woman House is more political aesthetics than activist art, but I wrote about it anyway. <laughs> get into this, pro but so for those of the, that are in the audience saying, oh, I don't remember that project, this is at CalArts. These are um, artists that we associate with um, 1970s feminist art practice, including Judy Chicago. Um, and uh, they, they transformed a, a space into a, a three-dimensional interactive, um, what we might now today call installation work that, that dealt with issues of um, uh, gendered labor. And uh, exactly, this is, you say, well, it's at CalArts, it's at an art school, There's there, these are artists. Um, but of course, in some ways, artists bring their labor to the movement. And so you get this, this kind of problematic, which is, well, if it's for art people, is it still activism? What if it's activism that reflects on the museum? What if it's an intervention into the politics of the museum? Is that activism or is that artwork? Um, and we have that question sort of mixed into the bunch. I think uh, uh, perhaps a better example of feminist interventions into museum space is a node that someone else in the class wrote, which is the Guerrilla Girls and their interventions, especially um, with the Museum of Modern Art, but uh, in gallery spaces in general. And that took activism to the museum because it was specifically protesting the lack of representation within museums of women artists, especially in contemporary settings. So um, that is one way that something can be museum-based, but still be inherently activist. So that there's, an, there's a definition, uh, and yet that's for an artist audience in or an artwork audience in a sense. And then we talked a little bit about during Occupy, there were um, there were objects that were posters, that were placards, that were also ladders for climbing over fences, and you know that this served as a kind of activist artwork. But but then you start wondering, well, what makes that an artwork? You know, just a tool. Um, if it has to have utility to the movement, is it about visibility? So as you can see, these things get challenging, um, and yet still motivated great conversations. Um, Flora, I'm interested, you know, your artistry is not visual or not as visual as the kind of what we used to call the plastic arts. Um, and so I wonder if the questions feel different in say fiction writing, because it, it, it would be almost nonsensical to think of, of activist fiction that wasn't geared toward a 
an, a fiction audience, you have to read the thing in order to be participating, right? Um, that's true, you do. I think that with fiction, definitely um, you, are, um, you are reaching an audience that is an audience that self-selects, right? Because you're not broadcasting, you're not putting it out there on, you know, you're not sharing it on Instagram. People have to make the decision to pick up a book or to open a magazine. Um, but as far as like how, you know, I've been processing all this or how it's useful to me, I mean, I'm really interested in art as a transformative tool, right? So I'm interested, and, and I also really believe in the interrelatedness of the art. So as a fiction writer, it's enriching for me to write about visual art and to engage, um, and, and to engage visual processes um, through, through imagination or through writing back, through writing ekphrastically, through writing back to visual artworks that people have made and thereby kind of adding my voice to the conversation. Um, I, you know, I think one point that's perhaps interesting is that the act of making art can also be transformative uh, for the person who's doing the making, right? Mm -hmm. Not just for you know, the person who's receiving it, the audience that receives it. But I certainly got the sense in our conversations with Erin Conaway that the process of being involved in, um, in, in the protests and being involved in Louisville standing up for racial justice and working with all of the other people who wanted to you know, celebrate Taylor's life, it seemed as though it was transformative for him. And I think that that element of artist engagement often gets overlooked when we talk about these things. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I think that we're, we're so we're comfortable now or we know about artwork that works on us as an audience member. Um, but we're so also so interested in the subjective position of artists, where they came from, who they are, their identity. Um, we can't forget the the that essential moment of transformation when they make the work that it's acting on them too. Um, they're not monoliths that just sort of produce things in the world. Um, they're as flexible as we are as audience members. So we all see political art everywhere. Kathy, it's in your gallery. Hannah, it's increasingly in your art making. Um, we've talked to Aaron. We talked to Aaron Conway, the artist, um, a lot about his process, about how this object came into the world, about how it evolved, you know, how it was propped upright, how it was integrated into all of these um, wayfinding systems downtown, and then eventually into media coverage of the protests. Um, where do we go from here? You know, you're you're a, a, as much experts in the field of of activist art and political art as I am, um, and and maybe we'll ask individually here, um, Kathy. You see folks purchasing art, interest in political art. Is it increased recently? Is that right? It it has, and it's again the moment that we're in. I have collectors that are wanting to witness and remember this time. Um, it's almost like during a period of the 60s when you didn't have African-American artists that were really accessible to the everyday person, most African-American homes, their big three, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy, and Jesus, big four. And so now there's an opportunity for collectors to go beyond that. But it gets personal when you look at what one collector may want to have as, a, as compared to what another collector may have. And as a result, artists are express, expressing themselves artistically in different ways. It's, it's not all um, brutal scenes. Um, you have a lot of symbolism that I'm seeing people gravitate to. So it, it varies based on the individual, but there is a desire to serve as witness and to hand this down to their uh, next generation. Can I ask what the clientele that you're working with, have you found more white folks interested in art by artists of color? It, it has increased in the, in the past year. I'm, I'm shipping uh, Woodrow Nash sculptures to non-African Americans and his, his sculptures are African Nouveau, they're very distinct. They're very um, um, ethnic. Mm -hmm. And um, I've worked with local clients on adding, uh, diversifying their art collections. 
So it's it's been um, enlightening for my husband and myself because yeah. we have to um, be open to more um, segments of the community and be able to offer more items that you know kind of reflect the times. So it's uh, yeah. you don't see that changing anytime soon. No, no, we don't. And I think with COVID, with more people refocusing, everything shifted. What we were used to doing, we're not doing, we're at home more. And more people had an opportunity to really spend time at home and contemplate and do a little fixing up at home. <laughs> so <laughs> that works to the advantage, whether they're reframing something. But there was... Um, a saying, you know, that's in the younger generations, you know, of being woke. Mm. I, America is woke now as a result of what we've witnessed this past year. Let's hope maybe on the way. <laughs> uh, Hannah, what do you, do you think your work, as politics has begun to enter your work um, increasingly over the last year or two, do you see that changing at all? Um, I hope to make even more political work as I go on and become more overt about it because I feel like a lot of my work has um, worked under many layers of symbolism. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I often work with this idea of radical vulnerability or the idea that one person's um, narrative and especially one person's trauma can speak um, to a larger whole and be a microcosm of larger abusive power structures. And so through that, I put a lot of myself and my own narrative and my own traumas into my artwork because I feel like it is deeply connected to the fact that I am a woman. Uh, and I, I think that it can serve as a larger, as a microcosm to a larger systematic um, structure where uh, these traumas are so common for women, especially that it seems like an almost inherent part of womanhood. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I guess I, uh, I'm really branching together the personal and the political, um, which I feel like is something that a lot of people shy away from. A lot of people look down on anything that has personal narrative in it. Um, they'll think that it's selfish or in some way just meant to be therapeutic when in reality, one person's story can really speak a lot for a larger whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a whole, we could do a whole conversation just on the the relationship of the personal and the political and um, you know, the ways in which sometimes that's a liberation and sometimes that feels enforced. I, you know, Zoom has made it the case now that my, you know, our personal lives, our rooms, our houses are, are we're all radically vulnerable sometimes mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I don't know when my toddler is going to come running into the room. Um, and Flora, I was going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you kind of two questions uh, and you pick one here because I'm interested in both what you think the trajectory of, of, whatever you call a political or an activist aesthetic is in fiction writing moving forward. Um, but I'm also interested in what you think the viewership looks like, what the what we're demanding of museums as someone who goes and sees art and looks at art, um, what those demands are looking like increasingly into the future. Wow, well, those are two wow. awesome questions. Um, and I think they're actually related really because more and more what what I see or maybe what I, what I feel myself and what I think I see and I hope to see in audiences and in readerships is that we are in this moment where post pandemic or almost or I shouldn't really say that because we're really not post pandemic. Mm. Um, <laughs> but as we come through a very difficult year, I think people are um, asking more of the arts, both literature, theater, and visual arts. I think we're asking more of museums. I think it's not good enough now for literature or theater to be viewed just as entertainment. I think that it's not, you know, we're not satisfied with art that comments, um, that just comments in a generalized way. I think more and more what I see is the demand and the need for the arts to step up and to help us figure things out, help us understand how we got here but also maybe to facilitate um, some form of measurable change, whatever that, whatever mm -hmm. that might look like. Let's, that's an opt uh, let's end on an optimistic note that this is what the future art will offer us. 
Um, I'm grateful to all of you. This was a great class as, as um, the students know, but those of you in the audience don't, I, I actually abdicated my role for several of the seminar meetings and had the students bring um, artwork that they were interested in and uh, provoked really great uh, and amazing questions. And uh, hopefully it's a conversation that we can continue. But I, that's about our time. Um, so thank you to all of you and uh, enjoy the show. Have a great summer and we'll see you in the fall.